I have to say that I do not really like any of the contemporary views of eschatology. They all cheat. The only reason that they appear coherent is that their articulators make certain presuppositional decisions on key ideas and questions and then follow the resulting trajectories. Naturally, I do have my own thoughts about eschatology, but that being said I have not worked it out sufficiently enough that I won't be laying out my thoughts on it here. But, in a prefatory way, I want to lay out some questions every view needs to think about. I want to challenge your own presuppositions and lay out the key questions. My goal is that we'll all realize how simplistic the answers so often are, and that we develop a healthy skepticism toward any view that claims to have it all figure out. First why do so many Christians say the temple will be rebuilt in the end times when believers and the church are referred to as the temple? Here are the more obvious instances where Christians or the whole body of Christ, the church, are referred to this way. 1 Corinthians 3 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. 1 Corinthians 6 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Ephesians 2 13 through 22. But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I'm sure you've all read these verses before, but why is it that we don't think eschatologically when we read them? Perhaps we've been conditioned. Any view of eschatology is about the presuppositions that are brought to the text. None of the views are self-evident. I just look at my Bible and there it is amen. Air. How you answer the following questions dictates completely where you end up. 1. Are Israel and the Church distinct from each other, or does the Church replace Israel in God's program for the ages? If they are distinct, it would seem that Israel might still have a national future, apart from the Church. Keeping Israel and the Church distinct is key to any view of a rapture, because the Church is taken, not Israel. 2. Were the covenants given to Abraham and David about the promised land and a never-ending dynasty unconditional or conditional? If the latter, then the promises were conditioned by obedience to the law and, since Israel went into exile, the promises were sinned away. They were inherited by the church in a spiritual sense. See Gal 3. Christians are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promises. There will be no literal kingdom, just the church. If the former is the case, then it didn't matter that Israel was wicked, the land promises are still in effect and a descendant of David must sit on the literal throne. 3. Was the land promised fulfilled under the reign of Solomon or not? If you read the description of Solomon's kingdom and include the areas he had under tribute, the boundaries match the description of the promised land given to Abraham. Hence the kingdom promises are already fulfilled and there is no more to be had. Israel sinned away the kingdom, though, and it was replaced by the church. But should we include the land only under tribute to Israel, but not actually inhabited by Israel? That's the question. 4. Is there any biblical proof that the 70th week of Daniel equals the tribulation period? This is assumed by many, but the fact is that there isn't a single verse that makes this equation. Sounds right but is it? 
5. When it comes to passages that describe the return of Jesus, should we harmonize them, or separate them? Here's what I mean. Say a critic of the Bible came up to you and said, hey, your Bible is full of errors, just look at the Gospels. They have differing accounts of the same event. They can't all be right. At least one has to be wrong. I'm guessing your response would be something like, they can all be right even if they disagree, just like a newspaper story. If you took all the newspaper accounts of 911, they wouldn't all say the same thing, but they could all be right. They just complement each other. You have to join them together to get the full picture. That's what we should do with the Gospels. Now, I agree with joining and I think just about. Every Christian would. So why is it, when we come to the description of the Lord's return, that so many people do not harmonize them? We take 1 Thessalonians 4 as being different than Zechariah 14, because in 1 Thessalonians 4 Jesus never touches the ground. That must be a different return, and so we have two returns. One a rapture and the other is the second coming. This decision to not harmonize these accounts is at the heart of the doctrine of a rapture. You really can't have a rapture if you harmonize, but that's what we do everywhere else. So are you a splitter or a joiner? Which one is right? How would we know for sure? 6. Was the book of Revelation written before or after 70 AD? This makes all the difference in the world for holding that revelation has yet to be fulfilled, as opposed to being fulfilled by AD 70. There's evidence for either conclusion. Which is right? 7. Are we to read the book of Revelation in a linear, chronological fashion, or does the book repeat the same several events in cycles? Those who see Revelation as future prophecy assume the book is to be read straight through as a linear chronology. Others see the events of the book recapitulating. If it's linear, you have a literal kingdom aside from the church when you get to the end. If it's not linear, you don't. The church equals the kingdom. 8. All Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled literally, so the prophecy that's still left will be as well. Well, this assumes that all Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled literally. Whatever that means. But is that what how the New Testament authors see the Old Testament? Do they always see an Old Testament passage fulfilled literally? Maybe a prophecy gets a real fulfillment but it isn't what you'd literally expect. For one example, Amos 9 10 through 12 says. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say, disaster shall not overtake or meet us. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Now ask yourself what you would expect to be the fulfillment, David's house is in ruins and will be rebuilt. Now let's go to Acts 15 12 through 18. Acts 15 colon 12 minus 18. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles, to take from them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. How does James interpret this passage in Amos? Have fun! There are more fundamental questions, but they become more technical. I think this is enough. So how does everyone cheat? They make decisions on all these questions, and then act like their view is the biblical view. As though they didn't have to presuppose and assume a whole list of things at the start. They cheat by not telling you that what they believe about eschatology is based on assumptions about verses, not verses themselves. The Bible didn't come with a handbook with the right answers to these questions. The answers are not self-evident. There is uncertainty to put it mildly. Now you know why I don't like any of the views. All the views make assumptions and then erect their system on those assumptions. 
Passages that don't quite fit are problem passages. Yeah, right. Each view has its own set of those. Personally, I think there's a reason for the ambiguity in the Bible on these issues, which itself is the path to not cheating. But that's for another time. This is the tip of the iceberg.